Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. I want to offer some help for uptight people. <laughs> That's what I'm calling this tonight, just very simply, help for uptight people. Are there any of you that would say you kind of fit in that category of being a little uptight and tense and you get worried and concerned and you don't really care for it too much when things don't go your way? We got any people like that who don't like it too much when things don't go your way? Now, I know there's a few of you here tonight that probably think, well, I'm not uptight. Well, goody for you. <laughs> But there's a bunch of the rest of us that are, and we need help. If you're not an uptight person, more than likely you are married to someone who is. <laughs> How many of you are pretty relaxed and laid back and chilled out, but you, you got somebody in your life that is really uptight and about to see? So, <laughs> so this is for everybody here tonight. Amen. Now, I want to talk to you tonight about maintaining a relaxed and an easygoing attitude. You see, I believe that there is a holy ease that we can live with. Now, what I mean by that is not that everything's going to be easy. I'm not saying that everything's going to be easy. We don't really need the power of God in our life for everything to be easy. But even when we're confronting difficult things, we can handle them with a holy ease and a relaxed comfort through simply knowing that God is never going to leave us or forsake us, that even though we don't know what to do right now, that God will show us what to do at just the right time. I'm so comforted by the fact that God has promised to always take care of us. I want you just to receive that promise tonight. I feel like I have that word from God for my life, and it's a word right out of the word of God, so it's for all of us but you have to receive it personally. Can you just hear the Lord speak in your heart tonight? I will always take care of you. Just receive that. I will, God says, I will always take care of you. And you know, one of the things that gets us uptight is trying to figure out what God's gonna do. And I don't know if you've noticed or not, but he doesn't usually tell us. <laughs> the Bible says that God is never late But I'll just take it a step further and say he's usually not early either. <laughs> Why does God sometimes leave us in the situations that he leaves us in when he could just as easily solve the problem today as he could five years from now or three years from now? Well, because actually, to tell you the truth, the way we develop faith muscles, the way we develop faith in God and trusting God is by having to use it. The more you use your faith, the more of it you're going to have in your life. I was such an uptight, tense, easily irritated human being. And even as a Christian, even as a woman in ministry for many years, I just did not understand what I'm trying to share with you tonight. I kept wanting people to change. If you'll change, I can be happy. Anybody there right now, you're like, if so-and-so would just change, then I could be happy. Why do you have to make me unhappy? And then I would think, if my circumstances would just change, then I could be happy. And then sometimes I would even look at myself and think, if I could just change, then I'd be happy. But you know, God showed me something, and it, it was... Sometimes the simplest things can be such a, a revelation to us, you know, and a, and a revelation is deeper than information. It's not, it, it's something you're just like, you finally get it. And several years ago, this is what I saw. Joyce, the world is not going to change. There's always going to be people around that can be irritating. There's always going to be circumstances come up that you weren't planning on. If anything, there's a possibility the conditions in the world will get worse. 
But what God has taught me is I can change my approach to these situations. Even though the situation doesn't change, I can change how I approach the situation, how I look at the situation, how I think during the situation, and everything changes for me. The situation hasn't changed, but because I handle it totally differently. Simple example, and we have these in our life all the time. We left St. Louis, I got ready, thought we were gonna leave St. Louis, had a plan, we're gonna get here, we're gonna eat, we're gonna do blah, 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 okay? And uh, we were almost on our, to the airport, the pilot called and said, we got a two hour and 15 minute delay. Well, I was coming in last night to meet with some of our partners, and so right away you start thinking, well, if we're two and a half hours late, and I gotta be there at such and such, and what if I don't get there, and you know, on and on and on. Well, there would have been a time, and thank God I'm past those times, there would have been a time when I would have just gotten so upset, and I would have gotten aggravated, and been trying to figure out a way that I could get out of there on time, and I would have probably been willing to have flown right into the storm just to get what I wanted. Any of you ever fly right into the storm just to get? <laughs> Sometimes we've got a bad situation and we make it worse because we don't know how to leave it alone and just let God be God. Come on, I said, sometimes we got a bad situation and we make it worse because we don't know how to leave it alone. But now I can make a decision. It's not that I don't still have some of the same old feelings. I didn't like it. When we were told that we had to change our plan, nobody likes to have to change their plan. But I could do what I'm teaching you tonight now. I could just take a different approach and I can just say, well, that, that's what it is. <laughs> it is what it is. And I sure hope I get there to meet with the people I'm supposed to meet with. But you know, if I don't, then I guess they'll have dinner without me and somebody else will talk to them. Because the bottom line is, is you can't do something about something you can't do anything about. Amen? You know, there's a pretty popular saying right now, well, it is what it is. But you know, the truth is, is it is what it is. <laughs> and you really can't do something about something that you can't do anything about. We need to pick our battles. Don't fight a battle that you can't win, because all you're going to do is just wear yourself out. So we want to talk tonight about having a different approach to life. And obviously, our best example anywhere is Jesus <laughs> and how he approached life and how he handled everything from being unjustly treated to being rejected to being lied about. He had a totally different approach than most of us do. And in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, the Word of God talks about this attitude that Jesus had and tells us that we can enter into it and learn to do the things the way that he does them. You know, becoming a Christian, when you make a decision to be a Christian, it's a lot more than just a promise of someday going to heaven when you die. When you become a Christian, you're invited into a brand new way of living. You're invited to learn about the right way to live, the way where you can have peace and joy. I was a Christian for a long time before I started enjoying the journey. And one of the reasons why we call our TV program Enjoying Everyday Life is because I believe that's one of the things that Jesus died for. Yes, he died for our sins. He took the pain of our punishment. He took our sickness and disease upon himself. We're redeemed by his blood. But a very simple scripture in John 10, 10, the thief, the devil, comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I came that they might have and enjoy their life. And enjoy their life. And have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. You know, it's bad enough to be a miserable sinner, but it's doubly bad to be a miserable saint. <laughs> so the thing is, is Christians are supposed to be peaceful and joyful and know who they are in Christ and we should be able to face anything that comes our way and really not let it alter how we behave or how we act. Now, did anybody hear what I just said? 
we should grow to the point where we can handle anything that comes our way, disappointment, accusation, unfair treatment, whatever it is, put our trust in God that He will show us what to do. He will take care of the situation and we remain the same. We don't get rattled by everything that goes on. We have the rare privilege of trusting in God and letting those things only be little minor bumps in the road. They don't have to derail us. I'm very grateful that I don't have to get up in the morning and wait to see what my circumstances are now before I can decide if I can be happy or not. How many of you are glad that you're in charge now and not the devil? Amen. And by the way, if you're not used to hearing anybody talk about the devil, Jesus talked about him all the time. To be honest with you, I went to church for a lot of years and, and never really heard a good message on the devil. And I thought he was just some Halloween character that came out in red pajamas with a pitchfork on Halloween. I didn't know that I had a real enemy that was trying to kill, steal, and destroy. And absolutely not only hated God, but hated anybody who was trying to follow God. And I certainly didn't know that I had any authority over him in the name of Christ. And it was good news to find out to me that God was not the source of my problems, that the enemy was, and that as I put my trust in God, the enemy would have to bow his knee to the name of Jesus, and I would have victory. Now, Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Let me put it in light of what we're trying to say tonight. Come unto me, all you that are uptight <laughs> and stressed out and anxious and worried, and I will cause you to rest. I will ease and relieve and refresh your souls. Now let's be clear that it's not like God's gonna wave some magic wand over you, but what happens all the time is God shows us what the problem is and then how we can respond in a different way that will not then necessarily make that problem go away. You know, you really can't find anywhere in the, in the Bible where the apostle Paul or any of the other apostles prayed for people that their problems would go away. You say, huh? I sure have a lot of people ask me to pray for them that their problems will go away. You know what Paul prayed for? That they would be strong in their trials and tribulations. That they would continue to be joyful and happy and be stable and continue to be a witness. They weren't trying to teach people to try to get to a place in life where they had no problems. They were trying to teach them who they were in Christ and that no matter what their problems were, they were more than conquerors through Christ and could still have a good attitude and enjoy life. So you're misinformed about what a relationship with God is like if you think it means you're not going to have any problems. It does mean that God will deliver you from things and bring you through them victoriously. It does mean that you can have a very blessed and an amazing life. But it doesn't mean that nothing's ever going to come against you. Come unto me, Jesus said, and I will show you a way to live. I will show you a new way to approach life, a new way to approach situations in me that will cause you to rest, that will ease and relieve and refresh your soul. Verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. He's basically saying, take my yoke upon you and learn how I handle every situation. <laughs> For I am gentle, meek, humble, lowly in heart, and you will find rest, relief, ease, refreshment, recreation, and blessed quiet for your souls. Now, I love that because really what Jesus is saying is no matter what circumstance you're in, your soul can be on vacation. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Many of you need to give your mind a break. You need to give your emotions a break. <laughs> and many of you need to give your will a vacation because you're resisting everything that comes along that you don't like. And you have just resisted until your resistor is worn out. 
and you still have the same situations. Well, I don't want to have this situation in my life. <laughs> For my yoke is wholesome, useful, good, not harsh, hard, sharp, or pressing, comfortable, gracious, light, and easy. Everybody say easy. easy. <laughs> to be born. Now, I'm going to show you enough scripture tonight to prove to you that there is a holy ease that's offered to us in the Word of God. But first, let's take a little look at the attitude that Jesus lived with. First of all, he did not care one bit what people thought of him. Now, that one little thing right there could bring a lot of holy ease into your life. Amen? Now, let me make a statement that I like to make, and you grab hold of this. Nobody is truly free until they no longer have a need to impress people. As long as, long as we're trying to impress each other, there's always going to be an open door for the enemy to torment us. When he was falsely accused, he never even really tried to defend himself. Actually, Herod tried to get him to defend himself, and he wouldn't. He refused to even try. He trusted himself and everything, the Bible says, to him who judges fairly. That happens to be 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23, and I love those scriptures. Let's, let's take a look at it. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23. When he was reviled and insulted, he did not revile or offer insult in return. When he was abused and suffered, he made no threats of vengeance, but he trusted himself and everything to him who judges fairly. Many of you have some situations and circumstances in your life right now where you need to make a decision tonight that you are going to trust God with that. You're not going to try to vindicate yourself. You're not going to try to convince people who think you're a bad person that you're a good person. If you've been treated unjustly and unfairly, you're not going to get into the revenge business. You're not going to act like the people who've hurt you because then that makes you no different than they are. But you're going to look at this new way that Jesus is telling you that you can live. Now, th th there's a thought, and I can almost feel it coming out of some of your brains tonight. Well, that... He was reviled and insulted, and he just let people walk all over him, and he didn't even try to do anything about it. Well, I'm not going to live like that. That's a, that's a wimpy way to live. No, let me tell you something. It takes more power to do that. Let me tell you, it takes more power to do that than it ever does to go tell somebody off. It's not hard at all to go tell somebody off. It's not hard to be mad at people and to hate people. It's not mad to shut people out of your life. It's not mad to try to, hard to try to get people back when they hurt you. My father sexually abused me for all the years that I was living at home over and over and over. It wasn't hard for me to hurt him. I mean, hate him. That wasn't hard at all. But I, what was hard was when God told me to forgive him and to treat him good and to put him in a nice house and take care of him until he died. Now, that was hard in one way, but in another way, it was the most beautiful thing because it added a dimension of power to my life and my ministry that made me unstoppable by the devil. We are more than conquerors through Christ more than conquerors. You know what I believe that means? I've thought about this a lot. And I believe what that means is that I already know that I'm going to win the battle before the battle ever starts. Before I ever even know what the battle is, I already have a confidence in God that whatever comes my way through Christ, I can walk through it with victory. It may not be easy, but I can do it with a holy ease. How many of you are seeing the difference in what I'm saying? Something doesn't have to be easy, but you can have an internal ease about it. You see, it's the stuff out here that's hard. This is the stuff that's not easy. But when we have the right approach and the right attitude toward it, then we can stay at ease internally. And the truth is, 
is your real life is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. We're in the world, but we're not of it. We don't have to be affected by the world system as long as we stay hooked into God. Another thing that Jesus did that was phenomenally good for him, and it, 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 it relieves a lot of pressure, is he just simply always believed the best of people. <laughs> How much pressure could you just let off your life right now if you'd stop being so suspicious and just decide, well, I'm going to believe the best? I can tell you're excited about that. <laughs> he lived before what we call an audience of one. He lived his life to glorify God. He wasn't trying to impress people. He didn't worry or live in fear. He didn't place too much value in earthly things because he knew that they were temporal. He didn't have the stress of trying to own or care for too many things. <laughs> to be honest, in the Western culture, we just want so much that it drives us crazy. Half of the stress that people have is trying to pay for and take care of what they own. Amen. I said half of the stress that we go through is trying to pay for and take care of what we own. So don't go out and buy it if it's just going to make you more unhappy than what you already are. I finally figured out that everything I bring into my house has to be dusted. <laughs> so the answer is not always more. He wasn't surprised by persecution or trials and tribulations. He didn't expect people to be perfect. Now, boy, that can take a lot of pressure off of us if we just get over thinking that everybody is going to do everything we want them to do every day of our life, because they're not. I'll just leave you with that thought. <laughs> he knew that human beings made mistakes and that they would disappoint him. <laughs> he wasn't trying to climb the ladder of success. He only wanted to do his father's will. He knew who he was. And he knew that he was loved. Let me tell you a few thoughts from some of my messages about attitude. First of all, your attitude belongs to you, and you're the only one who can decide what it's going to be. Your attitude belongs to you, and nobody can give you a bad attitude, and nobody can give you a good attitude. I have to decide what my attitude is going to be every day and in every situation and you do too. That's our responsibility. Your attitude belongs to you, and you can decide what it's going to be. You can have an attitude that will make you happy, or you can have an attitude that will make you miserable. It's up to you. You can only change your life by changing your attitude. An attitude is your thought life turned inside out. It's an inward feeling that, that is expressed by an outward behavior. Think of it like this. If you had a bad day at work, why not just think about the man who hasn't had a job for six months? If you're having difficulty in a relationship, just think of those who've never even had the opportunity to ever be loved. Should your car break down, leaving you a mile away from assistance, Think of the paraplegic who would love the opportunity to take that walk that you're about to despise and get a bad attitude over. Maybe I ought to read that again. <laughs> Should you find a few more gray hairs when you look in the mirror in the morning, just think of the chemotherapy patients who would love to have that hair to evaluate. <laughs> Amen. Well, our happiness is often based on what's happening in our lives, but our joy can be based on what we believe, and we can choose which one we want to live by.
Dan 10 miljoen gevangenen zitten wereldwijd vast. It's a hostile territory prison. I'm speaking proof of that. Zij die achter zulke muren leven zijn mensen en Jezus vraagt ons om naar hen om te kijken. I'm here for a third degree burglary. I have a lengthy sentence of 400 months. The judge looked at me and said, I'm going to sentence you to spend the rest of your natural life plus 20 years behind these prison walls. A lot of people don't have family here, so they feel forgotten. There's not a lot of people beating the door down to get in here to see us. That outreach of the hand to touch their lives in a personal way, to, to come visit them, to, to see that somebody is really thinking about them, that somebody cares for them on the outside. You're giving to people that really are like at the bottom of the totem pole. And with your giving, that, uh, that's actually bringing somebody up. It's the fact that you thought about us, even if it was just to come by and have prayer. We just feel loved, you know, that we're not pieces of garbage, you know, um, thrown away, um, that somebody does value us still. And that there is hope, there's hope for us. Tot nu toe hebben we meer dan 3600 gevangenissen bezocht. Zijn er meer dan 3 miljoen cadeautasjes uitgedeeld. En meer dan 139.000 gevangenen hebben voor een leven met Jezus gekozen.